So welcome again to this um, video in the series uh, that I've been offering on my YouTube channel. So today we want to focus in on um, incarnational spirituality. I'm working on that this summer. And also uh, today we're focusing on the comparison between Zen and the incarnation of the word, a dialogue on two spiritual paths. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Gordon E. Karkner, a meta educator with UBC postgraduate students, author of The Great Escape from Nihilism and Mapping the Future, and 10 Myths About Christianity with Michael Green. I, I'm also writing some uh, blogs on this topic. Um, you can see at the ubcgcu.org blog site. And so you can look those up as well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we're answering one of the deepest human questions, the question why. Religion attempts to answer questions of meaning, identity, longing, there's the German word sensut, uh, destiny, guilt, suffering, and death. And to draw on, I draw on a variety of resources, cross-disciplinary resources, um, as we see in Warren Brown and Brad Strawn from Neuroscience at Fuller Seminary, Kevin Mongrain, a theologian, Raymond Garonsky, um, a philosopher who's really interested in the relationship between the East and the West, Mark Sayers, a pastor who applies this to his pastoral practice, and James Davison Hunter, a sociologist of culture from the University of Virginia. So we were drawing on a variety of people as well as biblical text. So really, we're talking about two main spiritual paths today, and everything really depends on these two possibilities. A, whether the transcendent God has taken an interest and spoken to humankind, invited humans into dialogue. This is the way of incarnation. And B, whether the absolute or being the one, as in Plotinus, remains silent beyond all words, the way of Zen. Just a little bit of background. History is vital to the incarnational perspective. The Christian insistence on history is an insistence on the concrete reality of the world. Thus, the action of God is a saving action, a retrieval rather than one of dissolution. Religion for Israel is a covenant relationship with God in the context of an earthly journey. For example, the Exodus, a, a great symbol of um, the spiritual journey. Religion is not a means by which the world is negated, nor is it the lens through which the light of a Platonic God is filtered. Rather, it is a relation with the transcendent God who wants the world to be lived in and enjoyed, not escaped. World is a creation, a good place for embodied flourishing. Matter, at the end of the day, is good. It is not the time-space world of, or history that must be overcome in this case. Rather, there is an alienation perceived from the will and design of the creator that is to be healed by the action of God and the redemptive action of his Messiah. And um, I used Raymond Garonsky a fair bit to understand the work of um, Hans Urs von Balthasar and the, uh, the difference between word and silence. You'll see that running through this presentation. But basically, under the incarnational view, uh, God loves world. The radical alternative, the radical outlook of Gnosticism, the Gnostic individual tries to escape the world of limitation, finitude, and death. Individualistic schemes of salvation lead one to dissolve one's individual humanity or to dissolve ties with the rest of humanity in attempts at union with the absolute or the all. The direction of such human invented religion and religious philosophy is the way of ascent towards the light, but most significantly away from the world of multiplicity, individuality, relativity, time, space, energy, matter, suffering, desires, and hope. In this case of Gnosticism, one is in danger of losing both the world and God in the process of such dissolution of self. 
The ascent is always the way of silence or negation, as we find in the quest for nirvana. Compare the incarnational outlook or paradigm. The one who became flesh brought the fullness of heaven to earth by so, and by so doing showed that the unity of God need not be destroyed when expressed in the multiplicity of the world. We don't have to be afraid of the time-space complex world. The transcendent creator of Jewish monotheism is the same God who became fully incarnate in Jesus Christ. Humans have no greater access to their creator and source of identity. Incarnational thinking or spirituality actually values both the temporal and the eternal. That is, there's a value on theos, the theological realm, cosmos, the time-space physical realm, and anthropos, the human realm. People realize this as they come to grips with the resurrection's power, as is articulated so well by Andy Crouch in his book, Culture Making, a book that fits very well with the incarnational type of thinking, particularly uh, good in uh, the application to the arts. So light switches on for people. Jesus emerges as the window on the divine that opens the potential to know and be known by God, as we see in the book of Philippians chapter two. Very much the idea that <clears throat> God has come into the world to reveal himself fully through Jesus Christ. So we want to start now comparing the two viewpoints and we start with the way of Zen. You see by this photograph, the idea of the lotus position rising above the earth, going to the light, uh, that sort of thing. So let's explore the, first of all, the way of Zen. Zen as archetypal Gnosticism. Zen is the apex of the East Asian development of negative theology selflessness as emptiness or what's called the unword here's a little latin for you anima technica vacua the soullessness of western technological society naturally creates a hunger for the spiritualities like zen a soul technologized to the point of emptiness seeks fulfillment in zen it seems to offer a means of escape from mechanism <clears throat> or the machine outlook and the devaluation of the self to a mere product production unit or performance. Craig Gay does at Regent College does a great job of this, looking at the impl impact of machine thinking on human beings in his book, Modern Technology and the Human Future. I recommend that. Zen was a tradition of the elite in China and then Japan and other parts of Southeast Asia now in the post-Christian West. I first encountered Zen in a second year religious studies course where I did a paper on Alan Watts and the way of Zen. And this is where I began to torture myself with trying to figure out what was going on in Zen. Today, it has a powerful grip on many people in the West, various forms. Zen is nihilism. Zen is the view of absolute nothingness or non-being. Nirvana equals samsara, a form of religious nihilism, a double negative of being and non-being. Zen represents the most intense, the extreme human attempt to escape the limits of the human condition. That is, as we said, the time, space, body, desires, suffering, world. Buddhism, as you know, the Buddha, his prime concern was suffering and how to deal with it. Buddhism or Zen Buddhism um, implies the annihilation of God, man, and the world. That's where we come to the emptiness of sunyata. Speech and meaning disappear. Finality and form are to be overcome on the path to salvation. So one must disappear in order to reach salvation. Again, on the issue of nothingness, nothingness writ large, we're talking about absolute nothingness. The illusion, illusion is being. Nirvana is the name of non-being, which equals the truth. Sometimes it's hard to get your head around um, this form of thinking as, as a Westerner, especially. 
Being is non-being. The way of Zen is one of realizing the identity of being and non-being and living accordingly in contemplation and everyday life. Zen philosophy of selflessness practices the loss of self, not the reshaping of self, the committed dissolution of the individual identity. For this way, one needs a guide or spiritual master, like a Zen master. Zen offers a radical religious nihilism, the belief that all things come from nothingness and are, in effect, at the end of the day, nothing. Humans just need to realize this fact. The absolute is ineffable, inexpressible, unreachable. The mystery of emptiness is a total paradox. Therefore, Zen is the unword, silence, self-annihilation, the void. In this sense, we see the paradox. Reality is unreality. Now we turn to incarnation, the incarnation of the word or the logos made flesh as we find in the book of John and other parts of the New Testament. So I've used this picture of a river rafting trip, which you can find in many places in British Columbia. And I remember going on one of these with um, my family and uh, how important it was to listen to the instructor at the back of the boat. Everybody was absolutely fully 100% engaged in the trip because you were trying to avoid the rocks and not tip the raft. So when the instructor forced, told the people on the right to paddle, they all had to dig in really hard. And the same with the people on the left. We, we enjoyed this very much, but it really showed the idea of engaging the world. So I think incarnation is a way of understanding the importance of engaging the world, of taking the world as it is and adjusting to it. And, and I think it's also saying that God takes his world and people seriously as well. So let's compare the way of incarnation. I would say it's probably, the reason this is an interesting study is that it's the Zen spiritual opposite. Instead of the via negativa of Zen's onward and mysticism, the incarnation offers the via positiva, that is revelation, epiphany, or inbreaking insight on the divine. In Jesus of Nazareth, we have revealed the holiness of one transparent life of love, divine and human, which is the ult ultimate epiphany at the end of the day. Irenaeus, one of the church fathers from the second century, the Bishop of Lyon, uh, spent a lot of time working on this vision of the Christ and in many church councils. Christianity maintains that the eternal divine realm is separate by an ontological, separated by an ontological gap from the temporal created realm. That is, it separates the transcendent, where God exists, and the imminent, where we exist. The gap is bridged, but not erased by Christ's mission of redemption in salvation history. That is, his exodus helped to exit from slavery. That's a, that's a very, very important point that I want to underline is it's important to see the different, the incarnate word interprets a personal divine self in the context of a time, space, body, consciousness, desires, world, time and eternity, finite, finite and infinite, temporal and eternal come together in this one life of Jesus. The word as in John 1, 1 to 18, the logos, was with God in the beginning and became flesh. This is God's greatest speech act. Speech act is a term that John, philosopher of language, John Searle uses to talk about this kind of event. This divine word or logos comes through a kind of great theodrama in three acts, creation, scripture, and incarnation. The good news for Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar is that the evangelium of God, of a God who speaks, a Trinitarian God, a three person who wants to share his being and his love, who wants to engage in dialogue with others, with us as free beings, 
he communicates his speech in a word which becomes flesh. Creation is one of the three major speech acts, as we've said. Ignatius of Antioch talked about this and called it a deed word. It's both deed, it's both action and verbal at the same time. The deed explains the significance of the word. They are basically intertwined. And so it is with the incarnation. Everything about Jesus was word and everything about him was fruitful deed. If we see the book of James in the New Testament, we realize the wisdom of God is integration of word and deed. That's an important balance. Our lives, in a sense, send a message as well, leaving awake as Henry Cloud talks about in the book Integrity. Trinitarian life is intensely personal love. Jesus Christ addresses each human being individually from within the loving community of the Trinity. Here's an important point. Each person must decide if they will bear the name of Christ and accept the unique mission that God has to offer. It is only by identifying with this mission that we become persons, fully persons, in the deepest existential and theological sense. We engage the transcendent in this imminent world. Person for Bon Balthazar means uniqueness and eternal dignity is bestowed upon the individual. This is an important point as well. To dissolve the individual's identity would be to remove the possibility of love and creative world engagement. Therefore, divine human distance from the other is vital. There must be otherness or alterity and also one anotherness, which is communion. Alterity is required for revelation from God, from the transcendent to the imminent. So in a sense, we are first sought by God and only then can we become seekers of God. I think that's an important balance in the incarnational spiritual journey. The power of the word from ancient times. God's self-communication to mankind develops in a level of conscious address and response. God's speech in and through the prophets was a mission given to select individuals, a mission which was different than the core of their beings. Prophets be performed a role, they bore tidings, but in no case was the role or the news identical with their person. The words which they spoke bore witness to the word in whose spirit they spoke, and yet they themselves were not the word. That's an important distinction. Jesus, on the other hand, is the primordial superword or uberort, the word above all words, the very speech of God, the full expression of God's own self. This word is a great imparting, grace imparting, deed word. The word is personal, crying out, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you under my wings as a chicken gathers its chicks. So the prophets only underline the word. That's an important distinction. And today we only underline the word as witnesses of it, of the incarnational way of spirituality. It's a full revelation, a full epiphany. Jesus, the God man, pulls all God's expression or speech acts together, creation, scripture, and incarnation. From the dawn of creation to the Beatitudes, to the silence of the tomb, it is central to the incarnation that God can and does fully reveal himself. Jesus is the sufficient and complete expression of God in this I-Thou dialogue. We'll say more about this I dialogue in a minute. So the gospel word is not just uttered words or letters, but rather the whole fleshly existence of Jesus is the interpretation or her hermeneutic of the Father. Theologian Kevin Mongrain helps us in the vital unity on this incarnational spirituality, the vital unity of creation and redemption. That's important to remember today for our own integrity. 
no matter how tempting it may be to bypass the ambiguities of the finite material, bodily and temporal in, flavor of, in favor of the purely spiritual and eternal understanding of redemption, we must pause. Humans have no access to spiritual meaning and truth except that they are embodied by the incarnate Christ's redemptive role on the stage of creation. He is the apogee of divine revelation, built on top of creation, not separate from creation. The analogy of this dramatic role provides a resource for indicating that the gift of redemption in the Christ event does not supersede human, humanity's embodied nature or creation's horizontal history. Rather, it irradiates them with spiritual meaning by glorifying the full nature of created human persons, enabling them to glorify God in return by sharing in Christ's temporal mission of redemption. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Next, the Christian then must practice incarnation, incarnational spirituality as a model of love, generosity, and faithful presence. And James Davidson Hunter has done a really marvelous job of articulating this idea of incarnational faithful presence in his book, To Change the World. That's from pages 237 to 54. Redemption or transformation happens within the created order. Messiah is re-articulated as suffering servant deeds, as shalom in the flesh and blood of his followers. Through this dialogue, the closer one comes to the sun by heeding to his call, the more unique one becomes, the more fully human and free. And here is uh, what I would consider a really beautiful poetic capture of this concept of the word and how it relates to personal salvation. All the fragments of reality, all the words are drawn to him as metal shavings are to a magnet. He is the primordial word before all words, the urbort, who at who has sharing in the divine essence is also the uberbord, the alpha and omega. In the flesh, he speaks words, fragments themselves, which are cast out like a net to gather the original fragments, turned away from their telos by misused human freedom, leading them not to destruction, but to fullness. Beautiful statement. So in redeeming the created order, Christ redeems all social relationships intrinsic to human nature. God is very interested in human nature in this perspective. Salvation accordingly, according to the incarnational way, is intentionally this worldly, as we see in Romans chapter 8, and the language of the redemption of all things in the New Testament. So here we're moving towards our conclusion of this uh, comparison. Our hope is in the presence of God, not an escape or absence. Another quote from um, J.D. Hunter. If indeed there is a hope or imaginable prospect of human flourishing in the contemporary world, it begins when the word of Shalom becomes flesh in us and is enacted through us toward those with whom we live, in the tasks we are given, in the spheres of influence in which we operate, when the word of all flourishing, divine, defined by the love of Christ, becomes flesh in us, in our relations with others, within the tasks we are given, and within our spheres of influence. Absence gives way to presence, and the word we speak to each other and to the world becomes authentic and trustworthy. Very profound statement. So disciples also incarnate deed word, as we saw in the book of James. Incarnational spirituality is rooted in profound underlying dynamics. The unity of creation and redemption, the unity of all the New Testament, that is covenant narratives, the unity of Christ in the church, this is the triforma of Ambaltasar. 
The New Testament makes the amazing claim that Jesus is, in the flesh, the wisdom of God and the power of God, as in 1 Corinthians 1, 24. The nexus and integral relationship of faith and reason. As divine Logos, he is the transcendent word made flesh, the underwriter of all human thought and language. Truth ultimately is found in a person, a presence, not a mere philosophy. It contains the most significant hope of reuniting the broken relationship between word and world in the late modern age. And Hunter has given us very good insights on this relationship. Which leads to things like the gift of hospitality to the poor and the marginalized. These beautiful children saying, please help. So here's our finale in this presentation. Jesus is reason personified, the raison d'etre of it all, the meaning of it all. He is the answer to our deepest questions. Why are we here? What is our calling or purpose? Where are we going? What are we really working for? What do we love? Justice, freedom, Power, relationships, suffering now make sense in the light of his teaching, life, death, and resurrection. God's speech in Jesus is embodied, full-blooded, not flat, lifeless, or atomistic. The incarnation is a communicative action, as Kevin Van Hooser talks about, much more than mere letters, words, or sentences. It is robust loaded with spiritual vitality and meaning with eternal consequences. It rings forth like an Oxford college bell with the poetic, prophetic, and pedagogical. Incarnation is dynamic theodrama, as Balthazar says. God has bound himself with humanity's very destiny. And we are transformed through contemplation of this truth and as we engage its veracity in daily life. This is a critical combination to avoid Gnosticism on the road to unity, truth, beauty, and goodness, to fulsome, robust religion. I encourage you to listen to this um, rap video from Isaac Wimberly uh, on the word, which he, where he articulates this uh, so well. And, um, in poetic uh, performative form. So here's a, a bibliography, um, which I leave you with as the, as the last thing in this presentation. And um, if you wanted to go further, I always, Think of these as a kind of starter culture to, to germinate things in your mind um, and get you um, reading and thinking in a certain direction, especially since these videos are made uh, for uh, university people and others who like to, like to think and like to get the big picture on reality, look at truth and its claims. So here are some of the resources that I've found really helpful on this topic and uh, I commend them to you. Thanks very much. It's Dr. Gordon Karkner on Zen and the way of incarnation, the way of Zen versus the way of incarnation. Hope you enjoyed the video and uh, we'll see you soon.